moderator. I don't have a gavel, so I'll, I'll try to speak loudly. I don't. But um, let's call the meeting to order. Hello, everyone. I think I know almost everybody here, but hello, everyone. We're recording in. I'll just call you. Hello. And hello, everyone on the screen. It looks like we have quite a crowd today. Um, now, with this meeting to order first, let's, um, with the members, I'd like to just um, have everyone look at the minutes from the last meeting. And um, you've had them in advance, and I'll give everybody one minute to read the minutes, and then we'll um, move on. If there's any, um, uh, we're not, we're, we're somewhat less informal here. So if there's any um, comments on the minutes, please say them, or we will just call those good and move on to the speakers. Um, while you're reading, we do have three speakers today. Two of them told me they've got a very um, um, time critical have to get out of the meeting schedule. So I'd like to move forward quickly with the speakers. I thought the minutes were excellent. I thought they were too, Rich. Good job. <laughs> Do you have you do this? It hurts a little. Bit, I guess. <laughs> okay, without any comments on the minutes, let's move forward. The first um, person is Katrina Blair, and Mandy will do the introduction for Katrina. And Mandy, do you have anything that you would like to say before Katrina? Yes. Gets, here, here's what we'll do is because there's people on the screen, why don't the speakers come and sit here and you'll all be visible? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Mandy McGill. I'm a regenerative agriculture educator, and I'm very excited to have Katrina with me today. Um, I just wanted to go over a couple of quick things, just kind of set the stage. Um, at first, when everything started kind of with talking about how we treat our land here, I focused a lot on toxicity, and there are a lot of peer-reviewed studies out there that are very accessible. If you go to projectdungbeetle.org, you'll see a lot of them listed. Um, and I also have a letter from a vet I received last night with a lot of her uh, references as well. So I'll be posting a letter from her on the website too here shortly. Um, uh, and also, I just uh, found out this morning there's a new article on the Project Dung Beetle website about um, the city of Irvine, California going completely toxin free. Um, that was a huge thing that happened. And what's really exciting is that they are now saving tons of water as well because their soil organic matter is higher in their um, in their soils. They've got more porosity to hold more water. So they're actually dealing with drought issues in the same Southern California. So there's all of that. And I want to do a quick snapshot today of soil health and how that directly relates to your wallet. Um, Super quick because there's so much awesomeness in the soil. If you didn't know, there's 95% of terrestrial life on this planet resides in the soil. It's crazy how much life is in the soil. In one teaspoon of healthy soil, there's there are more microscopic organisms than there are uh, people on the planet. So it's amazing what can happen with healthy soil and all the amazing relationships in there. Um, so just a quick snapshot, I wanted to go over mycorrhizal fungi really quickly because they're super important. They are a um, symbiotic fungus that attaches to the root systems of all of the uh, plants and grasses and everything and trees. And they have this really cool relationship where they're transferring nutrients and water. Um, and they release something called glomalin. And this is a new discovery as of 1996. We're still learning so much about soil health. And so glomalin is a glue-like substance and they didn't think it was anything until it was finally parsed out from the soil and they realized it's this amazing substance that holds tons of carbon. And what it does is it creates soil aggregates, which are clumps of soil that actually increases the space in the soil. So when you have soil organic matter, you have more space for water holding capacity. So for every 1% of soil organic matter added to an acre of land, that acre can hold an extra 20,000 gallons of water. So if you increase 5%, it holds 100,000 gallons of water. There are farms doing these regenerative practices, building soil across this nation and across the world, where they are increasing like 5% within five years or something. It's really amazing how fast regeneration and healing can happen. So this directly relates to lowering our water bills, especially here in the West. We are dealing with drought issues with, um, Take it's page. I'm going to put you on speaker phone, okay? <laughs> Here, watch. You can't get on the computer. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
Um, and so what that does is it protects us from drought, wildfires, erosion, et cetera. And this only exists in healthy soil. So as we add life to soil, we increase all of this awesomeness and it just has this cascading positive domino effect. And so I just like to say, I love Maya Angelou's quote, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Um, I also want to say we have a regenerative landscaping speaker series. We have four more talks. Katrina actually did our first one on May 1st. That one is recorded and on the website if you want to check that out. Uh, we also have information for the rest of the talks that are going to be at the um, public library and at James Ranch the rest of this year through September. Um, I'm also doing a global regeneration talk at the library for the Great Garden series on June 14th. It's going to be super fun. Um, so anyway, I want to introduce Katrina Blair. She is of Turtle Lake Refuge and Be Happy Lands. I have a quick uh, bio to read about her. Katrina Blair began studying wild plants in her teens when she camped out alone for a summer with the intention of eating primarily wild foods. She later wrote The Wild Edible and Medicinal Plants of the San Juan Mountains for her senior project at Colorado College. In 1997, she completed an MA at John F. Kennedy University in Orinda, California in holistic health education. She founded Turtle Lake Refuge in 1998, a nonprofit whose mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. She is the author of the books, Local Wildlife, Turtle Lake Refuge's Recipes for Living Deep, a book that focuses on the uses and recipes for the local wildlife abundance and Wild Wisdom of Weeds, 13 Essential Plants for Human Survival. I would love to introduce Katrina. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that great introduction. Wonderful. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and um, uh, am excited to share a little bit about some of our work. And I don't know how we could flip the slide. Should I just- You just tell me. Just tell you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, Mandy explained a little bit of Turtle Lake Refuge's mission, but we have a multi a dimension um, just as a little overview, we do have a cafe in town where we serve wild foods, and it's about education of sustainable practices. And then we have a farm out nearby the lake uh, where we grow local food and do education. Um, but we also have this project of, of regenerative stewardship called Be Happy Lands, and that's what I'm going to focus on today and some of our work. And so go ahead and flip the slide. Thank you. So we've been working um, around Southwest Colorado. And we, I just sent a crew of six people to Telluride this morning and we're managing their 560 acres in the valley floor. And that's um, where we're, and I'll explain how we do this, but we're, instead of using a, the herbicide method, which is one method, um, we're using an organic approach where we're actually just feeding the soil and encouraging the succession species to come in and add diversity. So that's real simple, our, pro, um, our methods. But we also work in Mancus at the Cottonwood Park and Electra Lake. We've been, we didn't work there this year, but over the last eight years, we've been working with them. And then the town of Durango has hired us for several of the organic parks, including the Animus River Trail, which is about 14 miles. And then we do all the open space of, of Ophir, and the entire town of Saw Pit, which is not very big. <laughs> and then um, earlier in May, we went to Carbondale and it was great because Carbondale hired the entire Parks and Recreation Department hired us to teach their entire staff how they were gonna be spraying a milestone on their dog park. It was 30, 33 acres. And we came in and, and did an education on how we do our practices and they shifted and now they're not spraying and they're actually gonna, do these regenerative landscaping practices instead. And, and then we also do different homeowners associations up near Telluride, Placerville, as well as in Ridgeway and locally too. Um, great, thanks. Next slide. And so we can go through some of these a little bit quicker. So next slide, this is just a few pictures. You know, different places have different plants that they're wanting to not be there. So for example, in Telluride, it's oxide daisy and cannabis <coughs> thistle. So next slide, we go in and work the land by both pulling some harvesting, depending on you know, the plant. If it's a perennial, we work with it differently than if it's an annual or a biannual. And then next slide, then we also um, will add soil amendments. So here she's spraying compost tea 
and this is an electrolake, and that's all Canada thistle. It was a nice eight acre of solid Canada thistle. So next slide. And then we'll also gather the seed heads just to diminish that specific plant. Next slide. Um, but what's a fun about our approach is that it works in the long term. So when we, when we do a short term approach such as spraying, it'll immediately kill the plants, but then you have to do it every single year. And so it's kind of an addictive cycle where it's not empowering the land itself to do the work for us. And that's what we do is we're feeding the life force in the soil so that over time, those thistles, let's say, for example, or dandelions, they're going to make way. They're going to actually move on because the ground is not needing those pioneer species. Uh, next slide. We also work with um, some of the parks in Durango. And so we'll work with this with um, plantain or dandelion. And next slide. So whether it's, you know, these ballparks that are pretty actively used, um, it's not hard to keep a beautiful lawn with organic methods. Great, next slide. And so our primary goals are we're gonna increase the fertility of an area, and then we wanna support the stability. And so part of the stability is that we're not creating more disturbance, because that's why sometimes we have these pioneer species as they go in, nature brings them where we disturb lands. And of course, humans are the best disturbers on the planet. So wherever we disturb, if we add more fertility and stability, then those pioneer species aren't needed. And then we add seeds. So whether it's wild land area, we're gonna add a diversity of wild seeds and sometimes some flowering and grasses. But if it's a lawn, then we would add the soccer mix or whatever lawn species of grass. And that's gonna fill in any disturbance where the weeds were. So we also are doing this ultimately with a bigger picture in mind of we need to protect our pollinators. You know, and this is just on our, how do we support all of life through our practices of also creating really beautiful ecosystems that are healthy. Great, next slide. So we will harvest the weeds and take out the seed heads. So we'll do that manually. Then we also apply the seeds, whatever seeds, like so for here, it might be a nice grass seed mix, but we mix it with compost and mulch. So we'll sprinkle that everywhere we've worked. And then we add additional soil amendments, which I'll go through a little bit more, but compost tea, fungal soup, and biochar are some of the soil amendments that we use in addition to this biodynamic ash remedy. And so these support, again, the life force of the land to do the work in the long run. So every year it gets a little more vital and the, the plants you want to grow there get a little more established and the weed pressures get less. So it's a nice, it's a nice progression. And then there's so many benefits, whether it's increasing the water in the soil and the soil mycology, um, certainly the forage. So there's a lot of beautiful additional benefits that we all will reap from too. Next slide, thanks. And so the compost tea, we make that with our fresh compost from our farm that we, we create. And then we add a sugar. So we're building the bacterial microorganisms in the compost tea. And we brew that for 24 hours and then apply it to the land. And it's like inoculating life force, almost an entire army into a place that might be, uh, it might be deficient. And so the more life force we get in there, then they start creating compost by their life force. They eat they eat things, they poop. <laughs> that poop then is the plant food that keeps everything growing. So it's like you're investing in the long run by adding this life force and sort of aligning with an army in the soil. And same with the fungal soup. With, with the fungal, we're working with mycelium, which is the those little white nettings that you'll see in moldy straw or wood chips. So we're bringing that and inoculating it into a landscape. And again, that stabilizes from the disturbance that the land might be having. And then the ash remedy is actually just helping create a boundary saying, okay, we love dandelions, they're beautiful, but not here. And so we create this ash remedy by burning the seeds and the roots, the fertility parts of the plants and applying that to the land. And that creates an, a boundary. And then all the effective microorganisms. And then we are also adding biochar. And biochar, when it's activated, is 
an immense amount of surface area for microorganisms to live. So instead of the land being just flat, you have so many crevices for creatures and beings to live and take, take home. And again, they're adding the fertility, their whole life cycle. And this is a, a kind of beyond our lifetime effect that will keep going. So those are some of the soil amendments that we add. Thanks, next slide. And there's just a picture of some of our, our materials. Go to the next slide. And this is us spraying the compost tea um, in an area and also the, the weed remedy, the ash. And the weed remedy is really just ash and water diluted in a certain way that creates this communication. Because if we think about any ecosystem, it's a system. Everything's communicating to each other and there's a lot going on. So we're part of that system by communicating our interests as well as our ability to fertilize and nurture the land. Great, next slide. And so we, just with my personal mission, I love educating about the value of these wild plants that we sometimes don't realize. Um, we're, I sent a crew off to Telluride this morning with a bunch of thistle, well, they're gonna be harvesting thistle root and they're gonna make a chai tea <laughs> from the root. So this is a thistle, a musk thistle, but the entire plant is medicinal and edible. And so we also like to feed people these plants because it really supports our vitality, our self. Because these, both dandelion and thistle are really good liver supports. And we need a really good liver living in the 21st century because we are exposed to so many chemicals that the more that our liver can be kind of like a strong toned muscle, it gets rid of it from our system before it can build up and cause problems in our health. And so these plants are, actually the best medicines and food we can um, bring into our daily practices. All right, next slide. And of course, you know, anytime we do something as a human community now, we have to think bigger than maybe some of the older models because how our effects, you know, our actions really do affect our global pollinator population. And it's, um, I'm a beekeeper myself. And so I'm really present to their needs and, Anything that we can do that supports their life in their quality of life, we, we need to do that now as a, as a human community. Thanks. And certainly ecological health in general. This is actually an endangered leopard frog that was, um, it might be near here too. This was in, um, in Electra Lake. And it's just, again, these frogs and these bees, they're very sensitive creatures and can be, they can absorb chemicals. And so the more clean we can give the environment to all the species, we're all gonna win. Great, and um, that's the last slide. I wanted to keep it short and sweet, so I know you have a big agenda, but I'd love to open to any questions if there's any, yeah. I guess I'd like to know that what Scott's charges us, which I have no clue, and and what comparison great. your charges would great. be. Thank you for asking that question. That was uh, something that I wanted to bring up. So when I gave, I gave up, proposal just as a draft proposal and I ended up doubling the number of labor hours thinking that that I want that we better be extra extra thorough but our normal practices would be half that labor and I think we can do a great job what we would do instead of trying to harvest every dandelion we would focus a lot more on the soil amendments still of course taking out dandelions along the way and seeding but we wouldn't so I um, the price that was quoted could be actually cut in half. And I think we would still do a very thorough job. So the price that was quoted was for two site visits per season, spring and fall application is $7,620. Yeah. And so what that pay Scott? $2,815 per visit. So five. And it comes twice a year. How much did you get? Yeah. Six hundred. Yeah. We, we had cut it down to once. once a year. Oh, we had cut it down to once. See, we, and and I'll, I'll tell when all the speakers are done, I'll talk about what the landscape committee's plan. You know, we met nine times last year working on this, and we did have a plan. Um, it's been temporarily interrupted, but I'll talk about what our plan was too. But th there has been no doubt reducing um, scotch and eliminating scotch is on the agenda for the landscape committee. Katrina, yeah. what was your new cost? So the new cost, I mean, actually, we could just cut that in half. Yeah, so that would be six, six, two, two. 
that would be $3,810 if we cut it in half. And that would be for two site visits. So, yeah, that's what you have. So, that's right. That, so that would be for two. For two. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of questions from the committee, if we could. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, I guess, about whether uh, our, you know, basic, basically the land, you know, what we're talking about here are yards, if you will, yeah. are strips of Kentucky bluegrass sandwiched between asphalt parking lots and a golf course. That's kind of what we're, what yeah. we're working with here. Uh, and, and what I'm not clear about is if <clears throat> maintaining our Kentucky bluegrass is compatible with what you're presenting. We work with Kentucky bluegrass in the sense of parks. So we work with parks too. So if that is the landscape preferred, absolutely. We can just seed with that seed, with the Kentucky bluegrass seed, but okay. still feed this, the grass and then fill in any gaps. And so it does work with that too. Okay. Um, I had a chance just to stop by a couple of the parks just to kind of get an idea and uh, stopped at Rotary and, and Brookside. Uh, how would those parks compare to what you think our results would be here? Well, I think that it would be compatible. Um, one thing we do with our city is we, we partner with them. So they still mow and they still water and they aerate and they do some overseeding also. Okay. So we would want to probably do that as well so that you know okay. we're not mowing okay. and all of that. So it'd be a partnering where we would add the soil amendment component and then continue to oversee. Yeah, that was one of my other questions was how would our maintenance change? Yeah. You know, we basically do weekly mowing with that's that sort of thing that yeah. we would continue to do that. We can, and we might want to be a little bit in communication just so that we can support them. And um, but yeah, I don't think it would miss a beat in that yeah. sense. Yeah. So so <laughs> it would be accurate to say that that our yards wouldn't look any different under your management than they look today? Well, one question I have for that, to be able to answer that accurately, currently in the springtime, do there, are there dandelion blooms? Yes, we have you, some. You have some. And then, um, and then you mow them. And then for a little while, they might pop back up a couple of times, but then it's kind of their season's done. Well, we've been treating it. And they've yeah. been treating it too. But the dandelions, come out in the spring, even if you do treat a little bit. Mm -hmm. So they would with us too. But then if you mow them every week, um, it goes down and their season is over. So even though they're still there and they'll come back next spring, which they do, um, they're not obvious. And so it's still a beautiful green lawn. So that would be accurately similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar. Okay. All right. Have you ever worked with HOAs before? I have, yeah. Um, the Ptarmigan Ranch is in the HOA out of Ridgeway. Um, yeah. And, and I had similar similar question. Is, is there is there somewhere that that we could go to see uh, this in practice? You know, I know there's not another one in Durango. We're kind of a unique yeah. unique community, yeah, yeah. but but somewhere in Colorado in a golf course resort or right. something so similar be, that, yeah. that that we could see this? Some of the lands that we do are the wild lands, so it right. looks different, right. um, where they're trying to get rid of a little bigger acreage right. of some exactly. of the wild plants. But so really it almost feels like it's where we go to people's yards and, and I have a, we missed the picture, but we had a perfect before and after picture. Because you know, when the before is all the dandelions, and then after we work, they're gone. But they're not just gone. Um, <clears throat> we're also nourishing the soil so that the progression is moving towards greater stability. So that's that's not seen immediately. That's kind of a longer term effect. How long but is it, long? Um, three years is a nice range. But as far as a place that you could go, I think that's great. You went to some of the organic parks. That's probably the best I could say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if we wanted a good view of what, yeah. what we might look like, yeah. Brookside, right? Yeah. It seemed to me Brookside was probably more uh, in line diverse. with what we would have here as opposed to the okay. Rotary Park just because of yeah. the foot traffic and that right. sort of thing. And also Brook, 
Brookside is kind of around buildings. Yeah, that's true. So, and we do also Needham Elementary School and Park Elementary School. So those are, they're a little bit bigger fields. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. But I bet you have examples of where the thistles were and where they're not now. Mm -hmm. It's probably fairly close here that we can see. Yeah. Um, let's, yeah, let's see. Um, I mean, there's, if you wanted to go to the dog park in Mancus, we're working there. That's the local. That is thistles. Right that's, there. Yeah. yeah, thistles there. Yeah. Right, and since some of them are a little more north where we're working, definitely there's some personal homes that we work. We work with the Sunshine Condominium, um, and that's an, are you familiar with the Sunshine Condominium? Durango. Yeah, Durango. That's on 32nd Street, um, Sunshine Gardens, and they have a condominium complex. And what about hoary crests or white top? Yeah, the because white it's top. coming in in the golf course, and I've been on top of them, but it's back again. Yeah. So. They have these um, these fluctuations where sometimes after the rains, you'll see a lot more of a bloom, and then next year it'll be less. But um, we would, I, I think some of the best methods is just to mow it down, you know, before it goes to seed. That's that's some of the best preventatives. But then Again, it's it's one of those pioneer species. So the more we fertilize and stabilize, its presence is going to be diminished. Yeah. Right. The question I've asked all along, and and um, you know, thought for years. So we're unique here. Yeah. And what we are is we're about five acres of grass, surrounded by a thousand acres of glacier, and we're ducks. Mm -hmm. We're ducks mm -hmm. surrounded by um, glacier club. So we've got two competing factors there. One is it's a golf course, 36 hole golf course, and it is entirely chemically grown. The amount of chemicals that the golf, any golf course puts on compared to what we put on is probably orders and orders of magnitude more. So you've got that. Mm -hmm. That situation, which I'd like to see a comparison where the the organic solution can fit in inside of the pocket of this great big other chemically grown solution. The other thing is, is as we attest to every August, is um, we are a, between the golf course and us is a seed farm. Okay. It, uh, it's it's unbelievable in August when the thistle is blowing and some of the other species is blowing. And um, I just don't know how you control it, our little five acres among this great big seed farm. So another, unless th th that is controlled, I don't, and we, I don't see how that doesn't overwhelm anything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I had suggested to Mandy maybe a year ago is that we do a test plot here mm -hmm. to see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we are, and I've had a number of people say to me is we're a golf course community. Um, we like the looks of it now. We like the looks of Dalton Ranch, even the condos around Hillcrest, we like that. And so that is a standard that we've got to maintain. But again, I don't see personally how we compete on our four little polka dots mm -hmm. against this great big world that we have no control over. Okay, good point. One, one way that it can be harmonious and supportive is that these microorganisms that we're putting in with the soil amendments, they break down petrochemicals. So it creates a little buffer for your own health because uh, you know the golf course is um, beautiful, but it also, like you said, that has its how the the chemicals that are used are are higher, and you might not want those next to where you live as close. And these microorganisms in the soil can actually create an enzyme that breaks down some of the phenyl compounds into inert compounds, and then become actually nutrients for the plants. So it could act as a buffer in a way for um, the landscape around your home. So that's could, just could it also be overwhelmed by, you know, I'm again, I'm thinking you got all the, 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 the chemical, but then from the other side, you know, uh, the asphalt parking lots, you yeah. got all the runoff right. from the asphalt parking lots 
coming from yeah. the other direction. And it's are. interesting with the asphalt runoff, that's also potentially chemical too. Exactly. Yeah, that's my and that's point. even more reason why you want this army on your on your yeah. team to support your own life force. That's sort of how I look at it. But one question I have for you is about the seed garden. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's that? Glacious. So and that's not you. Uh, no, no. So I wonder if that would be the next conversation to approach Glacier to um, whether it's we support them with that or anyway, I don't know about that. Well, you know, that, that, that is a, that is a, a, a situation I can tell you right now that if you, you can drive up, drive up the road now and, and Glacier is dealing with their situation. They, they've got their um, a truck full of something or other that they're putting out on the golf course right now and they're out spraying. Yeah. So I do want to point out, I am working on a, a bigger plan with in uh, connection with Audubon International that we will be presenting to Glacier Club as an option to go completely in the direction of building the soil health, which you can do for golf courses. It's just something not a lot of people know about. It's kind of a burgeoning field right now. And there's actually a specific company called Worm Turf out there that's based in Colorado, and they specifically work on golf courses. Um, it also reduces water bills. So that's kind of phase two that I'm uh, working on. So, this is this is Doctor this is Doctor Merrick. May, may I interject, please? I have a surgery. I've got to start in like fifteen minutes, and if, if you don't mind, is it okay? Um, I think so. Let's go out of, and you have to be out of here when ten thirty. Ten thirty. So, why don't you just stay here? Okay. And we're going to go a little <laughs> differently here. That sounds perfect. We've got a lot of time. To do. Um, yeah. Dennis. The a resident up at um, High Point. We've got three speakers, sort of speakers today. Katrina's not a resident, but Mandy is. And we have three resident speakers today. And um, Dennis is up at High Point. Dennis is a uh, veterinarian. Dennis, your wife is a veterinarian too, correct? Technician. She's a technician. Yes, sir. So Dennis wanted to speak a little bit today. And um, he has a, uh, a practice. Um, he's a practicing vet, as he said, he's got to run into surgery. So Dennis, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, with uh, um, when we when we uh, uh, gave the the address for the speaker, I keep hearing that there are peer reviewed articles, um, and I don't I don't have a I don't have a horse in this race. But there is no there are no peer review articles that say that two four D is toxic or uh causes cancer in animals or people there's one case where uh, a dog uh, ingested a lot of 2,4-D uh was treated and was fine uh it's very difficult and like I said we don't have a, I don't have a horse in this race my my uh what I was supposed to do is to address the toxic toxic toxicity of 2,4-D uh in animals and as it's sprayed and you keep an animal off uh the the land for 24 hours it's it's fine okay i'll take any questions well margaret here um yes ma'am you know it's very nice if you have pets and you take them off but the wildlife we have we've got chipmunks and ground squirrels and rabbits and things like that they don't know to get off when it's being sprayed and i saw the ground squirrel die after it was sprayed that day. So this is affecting okay. things that are right there. And, and that's fine. My 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 job though was I understand. you know in before in the in the letters and whatever it was said that that you know 24D is causing cancer or dogs dying of cancer from 24D. I don't think that's the case. Uh, like I said, it's it's just that that's just that's why I'm here just from a medical veterinary standpoint. And you're right with the with the other animals. Um, uh, that I'm not saying that that did happen or didn't happen, but as far as dogs, cats, people, it's just not it's not a big issue. So, question: the two four D is spread. My name is Daniel. I live at seven twenty eight. Have a four year old beach love. Yep. The cattle spread in the grass. They put up warning signs, don't allow your animals on there for 24 hours. But right. then you think it's okay for my dog to go out and eat the grass on the 25th hour. I think there's, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think probably even before then. I, I think that 
that like I said, there's only one case of, 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 of acute poisoning from ingesting 2,4-D. And I think that was back in 2010. And that actually consumed the, the concentrate and the dog was treated and was fine. So yeah, I, I see, you know, it can say, well, it's not safe at 24 and it is safe at 25. I don't, you know, the way the directions are, I don't think that's entirely accurate, but it doesn't, um, yeah, I think I think that it would be fine uh, for that amount of time once it's dry. I'm Trisha Layfield. I'm in 701. And I actually discussed this with my vet. Um, and she totally disagreed with the application we're using because of the chemical. And I still go back to why do we have to keep our pets off of it if it's safe? And of course, I've got a kind of snide remark saying, do I get my dog pot salt? No, I don't. But if it's safe, we should be, and there are pet friendly op options from what I understand. Even Scott's supposedly has a pet friendly, people friendly option. Why aren't we considering that? You should, you should, but it's just, it's just not, it's, it's really hard to prove a, a negative in cases like this, but there's just, uh, and I'm sure that there are a lot of different ways to accomplish what you guys want to accomplish. My only thing is that there's, there's nothing in literature that says that 2,4-D causes cancer um, in, in dogs or cats. Chris, can I just say a little bit, because I've read a lot about this, and you know, it's my background, I'm, I come from the mining industry, and I was, uh, uh, in my entire career, I was responsible for health, safety, and environmental affairs, so it's, it's, it's in my wheelhouse. Pesticides may not be in my wheelhouse, but um, chemicals and MSDSs have been my life, and I think the answer, and from what my reading is, is and, and as I said to Katrina, her dad got me there, but um, what we've got with, and, and, and it is 2,4-D that is the active ingredient in a Scott's pesticide. And the Well, 2,4-D is the active ingredient that's controversial. So it's not Agent Orange. It, it is, though, 50%. Stop. It's not. It's not Agent Orange. It's not it is part Agent Orange. It is. You can look it up. Stop. Agent Orange is a combination of ingredients. The dangerous ingredient is dioxin, bad stuff. This is not the half of Agent Orange. This is like um, water in, in mixing with another chemical. 2,4-D is one of the um, chemicals, and, and Dennis, you may There's want to- 2,4-D was combined back in the, you know, back in the 60s and 70s with 2, 4, 5, T. Okay. That was Agent Orange. Uh, the, the two, four, five T is what was the issue. And like you said, the, the dioxins, two, four D is totally safe. So it's, it's, it's a mixture. Two, four D itself goes back. It's one of the oldest herbicides used in the world. Currently, it is one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. So that is 2,4-D. Go to go to your question, Trish. Like a lot of things, you know, you've got to follow the label. When 2,4-D is wet that first 24 hours, there are what they call acute hazards. You can think of them as toxicity hazards. And, and from my read, especially in the very dilute form that we use here, they can cause rashes on skin. They can cause irritation in the throat of the dog was to um, eat the grass while the 2,4-D was still wet, that sort of thing. So it's a short-term acute problem. 2,4-D, um, as, as Dennis said, is, is there's the body of evidence does not support the 2,4-D as a carcinogen. Mandy, please, I'll let you speak when I'm finished. Okay. Is a carcinogen. Um, there's been a lot of studies, EPA dived over into it about 15 years ago and did a lot of studies on 2,4-D because there was concern about it being carcinogenic. 
EPA came up with the, um, with the conclusion that there was that evidence did not support 24B or 24D being listed as a carcinogen. Who? World Health Organization was did them. So while there may be studies, whether they're peer reviewed or not, Dennis said that they did more detailed work and they're not, the, the body of evidence is that it is not. Um, the other thing about 2,4-D, and one of the benefits of 2,4-D is it has a very short half-life. What that means is that um, a half-life means that after one half-life, a half of do this there. People, 2,4-D has a half-life of six or seven days. So once it's absorbed and dry, and it is absorbed, it's absorbed very quickly into the, the, the um, plant, unlike, say, salt and vinegar. Um, the way 2,4-D works is it sort of tricks the plant's brain into should I grow, should I not grow? Well, we can't, we're confused, so the plant dies. Um, it's absorbed, and um, then after six or seven days, it begins to go through its half-life progression. It's drawn in. That is my understanding of 2,4-D, but it does have a hazard in terms of a uh, 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 an acute hazard, not a chronic hazard, and that is during the wet stage, it could cause irritation and such. Dennis, um, that's my read, and and and, and tell me if, if if I'm off base. That's accurate. That's accurate. I just don't understand why we'd be using anything that would have any toxic effects on our animals. Yeah, well, that's our what we're, pets. That's what our, we're here. That's what we're here for today. Yeah, because there's a reason. Because we're a golf course community, and the best practices that we've known to date is to use this chemical. We didn't want to have our lawns looking like the the boundary in between the fairways and and our our grass. We, we're a golf course community, and that's what what I'm hearing the owners want. Now. We'll talk a little bit about what the plan was for the landscaping committee that we developed. And, and there's no argument here that that's the direction that we wanted to go is, is, a, is, is a low water, <clears throat> less chemical approach to doing what we do. I mean, we've been talking about that all year last year, um, but it was a, a process <clears throat> that we have put in place. We're learning now, um, but there's been, what troubled me is there is a lot of people in Tamaran that got very scared over the past month that we we're doing something nefarious. And I don't think that, that was accurate at all. If there are no other questions for me, I'm going to uh, excuse myself. Dennis, good luck with your Thank patience. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we should. Um, yeah, can we go ahead and go to Paul next because he has to be out of here at um, 10 30 and boy time is moving fast. And let me just read about Paul. I have a little bio for Paul. Paul is another um, president. We are really blessed with great residents here. I, I have it right here. One second. So Paul Brown is um, Dr. Paul Brown. He's the um, extension specialist and research specialist in the Department of Environmental Science and assistant dean and associate director of agriculture and natural resource program for the Arizona Cooperative Extension at the University of Arizona. Um, his background includes a BS in agriculture um, with an emphasis on atmospheric science, um, University of Missouri, MS degree in soil scientist, on PhD in the University of Wisconsin with a minor in meteorology. He developed the extension biometeorology program at the University of Arizona and was responsible for conducting, conducting applied research and extension programming in such areas as agricultural meteorology, crop and turf water ir requirements, irrigation and salinity management, heat stretch and force, force, force management. With all that, uh, um, yeah, you want to sit here? It doesn't matter. Well, maybe go ahead and take my seat. Oh, it was me you were worried about. I don't want the chair of the committee to be here. Okay. Uh, I've been asked to kind of talk about it. I was asked by several people to talk about 2,4-D, but a lot of it's come out here in the previous discussion, so I won't waste a lot of time on it, other than just what is 2,4-D, and it's a widely used 
synthetic oxen herbicide developed in the 40s, actually for World War II considerations, but it did not get used at that time. What the herbicide does is it mimics oxen. Dr. Bob, because he mentioned it. I don't think this is good for Anyway, uh, the oxen is a natural plant growth regulator that helps growth of most plants. But what, what the herbicide does is it mimics oxen, gets in the plant, and quite honestly, it uh, disrupts the normal cellular me mechanisms. And as a result, it results in kind of rapid uncontrolled growth. That's why you see spindly weeds when it's used. Uh, if you want to see it, go out and look at the uh, area, the play area next to the lodge here, because they have sprayed it and you can see the effect on the dandelions. It's used to control broadleaf weeds and turf lawns, right of ways, aquatic sites, forest sites, and a variety of agricultural crops. Um, and we've already talked about the 2,4-D issue and Agent Orange. Uh, the comments were correct. Dioxin was the contaminant in 2,4-5-T during those production periods that created the cancer risk for US veterans in Vietnam, as well as some of us. I grew up in Missouri and we were kind of the poster child for the domestic problem of spraying dioxin for oil with oil for road dust control, which created a major crisis in the state for a number of years. Um, the federal labels are indicative of what was just said, that it can be safely used if you follow label instructions. One thing everybody needs to recognize is all pesticides are regulated and they all carry a label. And if you've ever had to read one of these labels, they go on and on and on about safety, volume, use, what you can use it on and what you can. And homeowners and regulated pesticide applicators have to follow the label or they are in violation of federal law. So current uh, EPA, EPA guidance is that it can be used safely if you follow label instructions. We've already talked about the canine issue and the uh, cancer issue. My, I spent a couple of days this week in my retirement reviewing some of this material. There is a little bit of give and take on the cancer issues. Uh, but uh, to date, the uh, EPA nor any of the other federal agencies have yet said that it, the linkages are sufficiently secure to change the regulation or the registration of the pesticide. One thing it's important for this crowd to know, understand too is that 24D is presently undergoing a mandatory registration review. This is something the EPA requires of all agricultural or all regulated chemicals every 15 years. So all the concerns about toxicology and what you can do and can't do with this material is being reviewed now. I got on the EPA website this morning and their interim decision, which is what they put out and then they have their public discussion on the issue is expected in 2024, which is next year. So by next year, this uh, we may have new information from the EPA regarding the health hazards, if, if any, as well as uh, changes in the way we might use the chemical. So those are just some comments on 2,4-D. Uh, the environmental breakdown is largely through mic microbial action in the soil. There's some indication that ultraviolet light from the sun breaks it down. Mark was correct in discussing the half-lives. They range from three days to 14 days, depending on the environment and the type of 2,4-D compound you're using. Uh, so those are just some comments. It does move through the soil rather readily, which is a benefit when you think about an application. We usually, Gary, I think we suspend irrigation for a day or two after application. Is that right? I believe so, but don't, don't hold me to that. You're not supposed to apply it if you think it's going to rain within 24 hours. That's one of the rules on it. But once it's uh, once an irrigation is applied, it is going to be washed off the foliage to a large degree and will enter the soil. And there's there is good and bad about the soil. It moves pretty readily through the soil, but it is attacked microbially by an active soil and, and degraded pretty quickly. So 
there's a give and take. But what I'm saying is once the irrigation is resumed, the threat, if any, is going to be reduced significantly because it's going to be washed into the soil where the microbial process will start to degrade it rather quickly. Now, I wanted to focus a little bit. I'm, I'm not a turf specialist, but I spent 15 years at the Karsten Turf Research Facility at the University of Arizona as a faculty member working adjacent to the turf folks. So I know a little bit more about turf than most people think. And um, so I wanted to comment a little bit on weed, broadleaf weed management in turf. If you read almost any turf professional review on how to control broadleaf weeds, the first thing they say is you need to grow good turf. Because if you have poor quality turf, particularly open turf, you're going to get weed emergence and seeds. seeds are going to get in and you're going to emerge. I've walked these grounds a lot. I walk about 40 miles a week and I have two dogs and I walk up Tamron's uh, area quite significantly. And this is my take. Uh, this is evident at this facility as well. Where we have thin turf, we have more problems with broadleaf weeds. So what is the solution to growing a better turf? Well, here's some things that I see as somebody who's worked in irrigation and turf for 30 years. We have salt damage in the spring from adjacent parking areas due to our winter activities of, of uh, ice control. We have irrigation non-uniformity that can lead to underwatering of turf in selected areas. We have lack of light due to shade from trees. A lot of the thin turf here is really due to lack of light. We got trees that are shading it most of the day. Now, and we have nitrogen or other nutrient deficiencies most likely in some of these areas. The salt related issues can be solved by leaching. That's how we, in the desert down in Arizona, that's how we handle salts. We push water through, the salts go through and the soil slightly decreases in the turf form. If you haven't killed the turf, it will return and grow better. Irrigation non-uniformity is presently being addressed as I understand from this committee, but one of the problems you have in a facility like we have is you've got sprinklers throwing water up against topography and trees. And there are zones behind the trees. When that sprinkler hits the tree, the area behind the tree gets no water. Water goes down the trunk to the tree. So blockage by your trees as the sprinklers are rotating is a problem and creates irrigation non-uniformity. My feeling on this, the committee should look at this. I know, I know your rock, rocking budget was torpedoed this year, but in the future, if you get additional funding for dealing with landscapes, particularly for rocking, you should assess some of these areas where there's a lot of trees, and those may be areas where you want to go back in with rocked landscape as compared to turf because you're fighting a losing battle with shade and irrigation non-uniformity. Um, Now, regarding broadleaf weed control, uh, there's a number of other chemical options available. I brought some documents that I'll give to Mark and you can look at them. Most of the other alternatives are in the same general category as 2,4-D. There are a few others that are not, but you could check into seeing if they are considered a safer alternative to 2,4-D if you're concerned about 2,4-D safety. Um, most organic methods, and I'm talking about spray over methods. I wasn't thinking about pulling weeds. I don't like to do that. <laughs> um, such as vinegar, salts, oils, acids, and detergents. There's a whole laundry list of these materials out there. Uh, typically are not selected. In other words, if you spray them out there, you're likely to kill the grass as well as you're gonna kill the broadleaf weeds. They, some of them do work. Vinegar will work in the high enough concentration, but it'll probably kill your grass as well. One option that I have found that has generated considerable interest around the country, and I, there's a paper from Penn State University suggesting works real well, is a compound called iron chelate. Now, chelates are organic molecules that hold metal ions usually, and they have been used for foliar fertilization of plants for many years. You spray it on and the chelate allows the nutrient to cross through the leaf and helps sustain the iron or zinc or other issues that are in short in the plant. 
I brought a paper on this that Mar I'll give to Mark, but it's probably not purely organic in the sense of the organic agricultural movement, but it's, a, it's not in the same category as a pesticide that we're used to using. What this material does is you spray it on broadleaf weeds in a higher concentration, and broadleaf weeds had significantly different characteristics to grasses. They take this iron in at a high rate and it actually becomes toxic to the broadleaf weed and the wheat dies. The grass doesn't take it in very readily. It just greens the grass up, which is what you use iron to do anyway. And so it seems to be a pretty effective uh, herbicide. Um, and from what I've read, it's pretty non-toxic at, at all. It may not have any toxicity to it. So. If we're talking about doing demonstration plots around here or something, uh, this is something that you ought to take a look at. Because uh, if it would take the thistle and dandelions out of here, then it might be a viable option. Those are the two major weeds I see that we have a problem with. Uh, but iron chelate might be a possible alternative. And I'll just reiterate what was said, and then I've got to go talk about El Nino to a group of congrowers here in a few minutes. Uh, taco does need to address the broadleaf weed issue. Dandelions are spreading seed now. In fact, it almost looks like a snow drift on some of our islands in the central part of this area. Uh, thistles are on the noxious weed list in most US counties and government officials can mandate that landowners develop an effective control program. And a lot of those effective control programs involve spraying and mowing. Those are the ways they, they usually reduce these. Um, reintroduction of weeds from glacier property is going to be a challenge if they're not on board. And that's what Mark was saying. I got on the website the other night, there's 491 acre, deeded acres in Glacier Club and I found 22 in ours. And I don't know whether that's right, but that's the ratio we're dealing with. And the, the Thistles are just terrible again this year. They're coming up and they're in their elongation phase because the day length is sufficiently long for them to now bloom. Um, so I just thought I'd make those comments, uh, having walked these grounds and lived here for about six years, that uh, we do need to address the issue. You can go the chemical route. You can go the regenerative route. You can go a softer chemical route through iron chelate or uh, other organic materials for, for, for fertilizer uh, for the grass, but you do need to address the issues of the weeds because I think they're going to be here forever and we're just going to have to continue to fight them because glacier is going to reseed us almost every year. Uh, I've watched glacier and the thistle thing for years and wondered when the county was going to come out and get on them over. And so far, I, I don't know that they have. That said, I was down at the to the tennis court yesterday and they were spraying as part of the site. Well, if you go along the road now, it seems they get about 20 feet in and maybe that's as far as it'll go. But you know, if you go down around the helicopter pad and such, you'll see all the thistles curling at about 20 feet in and then they stop and that's probably as far as they can spray from the truck. Yeah. So um, that's pretty much my comments. Um, if you have any questions, I have a few minutes. I've just got to run over and fire up a Zoom conference here. But um, but I, I do think that as the Landscape Committee starts to look at areas where we have weak turf, we really do need to examine whether it's shade and irrigation non-uniformity caused by blockage of landscape or trees as compared to a soil-based issue. I think it's probably lack of light. Uh, and there are grasses that are, that will uh, grow better in low light. We'd have to go search down that list to see if it's an option and if it would fit in with Kentucky bluegrass because they might not be visually compatible. Questions? Paul, well, yeah. uh, quick question. I agree with the lack of light. How did the pine needles affect our soil? Well, I got curious about that the other day because you do remove most of them in the fall, I believe. Try spring. Um, that's the one material you're taking off this landscape each year. The, the, the clippings all, the mowing are all reintroduced onto the land. 
The problem with pine needles is they are uh, they have what we call a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, which means that when they fall into the ground and they start to decompose, the bacteria in the soil have to fire up to decompose them. And in the process, it ties up some nitrogen. So you might, if you did not remove them, you might see more nitrogen problems in the spring. Usually, if I recall, you pull them off about what, October, November? In the, yeah, in the past we have been. Then we do it again in the spring. Yeah, because you get a second shed sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But it, I don't necessarily think it's wrong to pull them off of there, even though you're taking some nutrients and carbon and nitrogen off because they do take some effort to break down in the soil and they will tie up uh, nitrogen nutrition in the spring, which comes from the degradation of organic matter. That's pretty much any organic matter. Yeah, but uh, if you get into the literature on carbon nitrogen ratios, things like manures and certain things that have a more balanced carbon nitrogen ratio, they don't tie up nitrogen as they break down. But if you put in something like wheat straw or pine needles that have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, there's not enough nitrogen in them to support the bacteria to break it down. So the bacteria goes out, takes the nitrogen out of the system and you'll see a deficiency symptom. This is pretty common in agriculture when they rotate uh, crops at, at times if you're not careful. You can create a, a short-term nutrient deficiency that can go on 30 or 40 days until that stuff breaks down. Dan, did you have a question? Yeah, Paul, Dan Tyler, High Point 583. Yeah. I'm curious, uh, with the chemical approach, is there any way that you benefit the soil microcultures as well, too? Uh, there's a lot of work been done on soil health in the last few years, uh, including trying to actually define it from the soil scientist point of view. Uh, the chemical approach alters some of the bacterial action in the soil, there's no doubt about it. But uh, most of the evidence on adding chemical fertilizers as well as when these materials get in the soil, the microbial population will adjust and break this stuff down or adjust. It just changes the way things work in the soil. Uh, if you add direct chemical, fertilizers, you're actually adding the nutrients in the forms typically that the plant will take, take up. So there's a very efficient, fast response to the plant. If you use the organic means, then you're requiring the microbial population to break this stuff down and convert it to the nutrient types that are taken up by plants, and then it will be taken up. So the organic approach works, but it has a time lag sometimes, and you have to learn how to use it so that your timing is correct on the nutrient uptake. Because things like turf grass have a bimodal turf uptake. They take a lot up in the spring, they go into a lull in the summer, and they come back in the fall. And so the nutrient availability, if you want grass to grow correctly, it has to be there at those times. And that's one of the challenges with, with the organic productions is you're requiring the organic matter and the back microbial population soils to break this stuff down make sure there's sufficient nutrients for the plant when it needs it. But, uh, I mean, if you add a lot of organic material to soils, you're gonna change the culture of that soil. But my experience in watching this over the years in Arizona where dairy manure has been used extensively on agricultural land is that it does do a lot of the things that the speaker said this morning, including porosity and water holding capacity and other things. But if you don't keep it up, the soil starts to regenerate back down to its original level. So it's very hard to get soil organic matter increased. And it's, then it's work to keep it there. You, you can't just walk away from it. It'll start to work its way back down to its natural level. Anything else? Well, if I, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I will uh, give Mark some copies of what I've got and he can uh, decide what he wants to do. I'll leave you with those.
and I will head out if, if there are no other questions. Good luck. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Yeah, yeah, flexibility. You want to count five as thanks. <laughs> Rich Corbin, so. uh, I grew up in Kansas City and we had a farm near Richmond. My wife's family is available. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. State Fair. Yes. <laughs> For full disclosure, Paul and I didn't um, share notes, but very interestingly, a lot of the things that Paul has said are exact. And if you stick around after the speakers are gone, we're going to work through our plan just with staff to just see where we're. But so many of the things that Paul has tagged as problems, low light under trees, um, irrigation. We, we, we are working really hard on our irrigation system to, to do a lot of things to improve it. And anybody that, that has been a, a multi-year resident here as Cameron knows that the sprinkler systems have not even been working half good. So um, we're working on it. And so we're on it. You know, it's, it's interesting. We're all saying the same thing. And I think in a lot of respects, we're all saying the same thing. We'll talk about where the committee was going with eliminating chemicals. I'm an incrementalist. Some people don't like incrementalists on, on a number of different levels, but I like to do things progressively and, and, and get down to where we can um, take things one at a time and understand where we're going in our process. But um, stick around and let's continue the conversation. Um, Katrina's still on, the other two speakers are gone. Is, is there any other um, questions for Katrina? I've, I've got a business related question. Um... As a contractor to these various subcontractor contractor to these various entities you uh, showed on the screen earlier, um, are you carrying liability insurance uh, as a requirement with them? We do have liability insurance. And to what level? Um, I I think it's a million dollar, but I can double check. Uh, it's yeah. Why don't I? I can get back with you on on the specifics. I actually have a question. I guess I'm just confused. I just want to be sure about your, your bid mm -hmm. that you had submitted. So you're saying that now we only, okay, so it says recommend two site visits per season, spring and fall, and that was a 7,600. Mm -hmm. So now you're saying that we only need one site visit? No, I mean? still recommend two. Okay. Um, but we would cut our staff from 12 to six people. Okay, why would you do that? Um, financially. Or the cost. Okay. Yeah. And I think we can still be effective. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're saying, okay. Mm -hmm. What would it do? Yeah. I'm sorry. And regarding the, regarding the cost, I, I know we're, I believe we're, uh, our applications of the uh, 24D with Scott's Prolon is twice a year at about $2,800 uh, an application. Is, am I right on that page? Yes. Yeah. And and what would be the annual cost of your alternative service? Three thousand eight hundred and ten dollars. Okay. She's saying only. So same, same. For, for two, yeah, for two applications. So okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, and, and we've talked about this before, is 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 some sort of area that where we can do a test spot um Paul suggested this iron, um, you know, I, I, I've got reservation. I'm, I'm an anti-thistle advocate. How's that sound? And, I, and I'll tell you where I come from on this is, is I've done many reclamation projects in very large areas in Wyoming with reclaiming mines. And um, invasive thistle was the enemy. And it's the enemy because if you take native grass species and thistle, Thistle wins the water war. It's it's just it's terrible when it comes to consuming water. And when I see the thistle seed production that we've got in Glacier here every year, I'm skeptical on um, how we control it. Just and 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 again, being an, an incrementalist, I'd like to move forward with something where we can test things to see how they work before we just dive into things and maybe not be happy with the result. One more quick question with thistle: Do you know if it's the perennial thistle or the biannual thistle? Or is it it is, I believe this is the bi. Okay. And um, the I'm musk a, thistle that gets quite big. No, I don't think it's not. No, the musk thistle is different. That's yeah. That's got the big, nice yeah. clumps. This is that, I think it's, um, um, is it Canadian okay. or Russian? Yeah, it's, it's, and, it's Canadian. And it's it's Canadian thistle. You know, it, I've, I've been here, what, five, six years? 
and just watching some of the places go from a few plants. Yeah. This last year was just phenomenal how it spread like wildfire. Uh, and not on, on our property, you know, our property, we're keeping it down with 2,4-D, but um, in the in the intermediate areas, uh, it, it almost got so you couldn't walk through the brush anymore without just being painful to your legs. It was getting so thick. So we have a question online. Yeah, Stacy's asking, we've heard of price comparison and I've heard process comparisons. Very basic question. If we move to the bee having process, would our property look the same? So our goal would be to have it imitate as close to looking the same as possible. Um, we would ask for support of mowing, which is also just going to keep um, any of the dandelions coming up right. that we miss. Of course, when we when we harvest the dandelions, obviously we're diminishing them. It's almost like when you when you spray a 2,4-D on a dandelion, it curls and it takes several days before it actually disappears. But when you hire us, it goes away. So the instant gratification is right there. You know, you you won't have a curled dandelion for a few days. It'll just be gone because we'll pop it out and then spread seeds. But we can't get all the roots. So they will come back. And that's also why if you keep mowing it, um, it keeps a beautiful green lawn. And we're going to be adding the soil amendments, which will be fertilizing to keeping it green. So our goal is, yes, we're aiming for that. And also I can't guarantee, um, you know, there'll be, there may be some differences. I guess that's also part of the, the right. check to see if it's satisfactory. So yeah. It would be fair to say again, for the people that have that concern, is it going to be the same and, yeah. and so on is to uh, visit. Visit the parks. Visit the parks in uh, Durango. Because in my experience with the parks, they look, beautiful and you couldn't even tell the difference and most people can't tell the difference so that is a great mm -hmm. way you can just see yourself and decide if it yeah the other question is uh, how often do we currently mow and how often would mowing support be required we're mowing the property right ryan you're just moving from one area to the other so we're move we're mowing each area at least once a week so would it be required more than that? No. To... Once a week is perfect. Right, Ryan, that's how much we're going for. So, yeah. Um, so, probably no more than that, right? Right. Okay. So. I have a question. So, even <clears throat> with, weed, with the weed control process, do you still, we still need to apply a commercial um, nitrogen fertilizer to maintain nitrogen levels? You don't need to. Um, but if there was an organic fertilizer that you wanted to add into it, that wouldn't hurt. Like malorganite? I'm not sure if malorganite. Malorganite. I, I, I worked as a kid in a golf course. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, malorganite. <laughs> yes, it's from Milwaukee. It's from Milwaukee. <laughs> Do you really want to have the details? But let's just say it's, it's organic. Okay. So um, there could be support with an organic fertilizer and overseeding. I don't know if you do any overseeding, but that's something we work with with the city, which just means um, applying more seeds into the places to make those thin areas more lush. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about your... that. We overseeded last fall and I inspected it. I didn't see a lot of stuff coming up, but this goes back to what um, what Paul said is a lot of the areas where we've got bare spots, you know, my, my quick saying is it, you can either have trees or grass, but not both. And it, under the trees, um, it's, it's around a lot of these areas, which just seems to get a lot of the salt um yeah. you know he, he hit it on the head that you can't grow grass where grass won't grow so yeah. that's and, and that's where we're one of our plans and you know it's a long tenure we discussed this in the committee we've got a 10-year plan incrementally by word incrementally to replace a lot of the, the places where grass just won't grow with either rock or mulch and um you know we have an unlimited supply of mulch, I'm told, last year, because, this year, because we did a huge, huge um, um, our wildfire mitigation process last year where they ground up all the stuff and we've got a mountain. Is that a good? <laughs> a mountain of mulch that's just sitting decomposing just north of here. So we've got an that's unlimited good. supply that's, of mulch. And, and that, that is our plan is to replace, you know, um, do more mulch. Um, rock, but it's it's not anything that happens like that. It's something that happens over time. I have a question for you. So, <laughs> Mr. Brown mentioned some other um, 
that we might see dying grass from other um like vinegar right or something but you have, never, have you ever seen that with your we don't use anything that kills anything so okay. we actually all of our whole efforts is just promoting the life force that then okay. keeps going just want to yeah. be sure yeah. i would ask i personally tried salt and vinegar last year right out in front of mike's place it lasted about a week they all died back but then they came everything came back <laughs> Um, I do want to point out something I think everyone probably knows is just because the government says it's safe doesn't mean it is. Um, case in point is Roundup. So glyphosate is the main ingredient in Roundup, and there are tons of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cases happening all over the place right now. So I think that's something we need to take into account. Um, and also, uh, yes, Agent Orange is made up of two main chemicals, and half of it is 2,4-D, precisely. Um, I have a National Institutes of Health article pulled up on that that I can post as well. Um, so I just want to be clear, we actually are doing for the use of toxic chemicals. Like, that's just a question I want to put out there because there's a lot of other amazing ways that we can support the health of this land and have a beautiful landscape. It just doesn't make sense to me that we'd be arguing that to other people's points as well. I guess I'd like to add something. I mean, I think the whole concept here of tamarind, I believe it would be a selling point saying we're moving towards this regenerative thing. I mean, having green environments, that's the, if you travel, you know, what are getting the tourists there? What are getting people? What are getting people to buy new residents? It's knowing that. When I moved in here, I asked people, were there any toxic things? I was told no. So I'm not happy that I was told that, you know, so I would not have bought it knowing, you know, and, you know, if we're debating about toxicity, all I have to say is I saw the ground squirrel die and it was wild application. We have wildlife here. We live on the edge of wildlife. You know, we should be embracing that. And I'm, you know, after two days, then it's fine, okay, but you don't see what happens during those two days. I did, but most people don't. So, thanks, Margaret. Yeah. I took Carol Nisbet and David Nisbet here. I totally agree with the last two speakers. I don't like toxic chemicals put out for our wildlife and our dogs, our pets. The end. David, do you have anything? No. Okay, that's it. I'd like to still know why we can't have Taryn Morrell, who's tended to this property for 34 years, why we don't have her working on this. I know this, we've come up here after not being here for nine months. We came up here driving in, we see dead limbs everywhere. We see our flower beds aren't anything like they used to be. It, the difference in the property simply stunned us. It does not look like it did when Taryn Morrell was in charge of landscaping. Period. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, we can we can probably deal with that at the end of the meeting. We've yeah. got a busy schedule agenda to get through. I see. We would like to hear it. Well, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. So again, um, I think that we've had a good, robust discussion on this. I, I think that we need to visit the parks. As I said, I'm an incrementalist. I'd like to see some, some test spots that we could do. Um, and and I'll, I'll be glad to work with you all on that. Um, I don't see how we get our weeds under control unless, and, and I've heard, Paul say 26 acres, that may include buildings and yes. parking lots. Yeah. I, I did a quick planimetry um, work on the irrigated land. I came up with about five acres. So we've got five acres of irrigated ground, maybe another 
five acres in the behinds, I'll call it behind the, the units where um, it's not irrigated. So we're we're just a, a speck in the middle of a um, big forest of, of, um, of um, seed production. And it is massive seed production. And just, just open your eyes in, in August and it's just, it's snow. It really is, it's like it's snow blowing when the thistles, thistles start blowing. So it, it, it's something that we have to deal with and something that we have to manage. And, you know, in as much as, um, and, and we've got 380 owners here, 378 owners. And the one thing that this committee has to do is report to the board and the board will make decisions on how we move forward. But the board has, and, and I'm, I happen to be, have one of those seven seats right now, but the board has to balance the interests of 380 owners. And, and again, we're a golf course community. So we have to maintain that appearance as well. And, and again, stick around. We're gonna go through our plan here in a little while. Um, what we're hearing from everyone is not going unnoticed. It's just how we get there. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, Virginia, could you just explain one more time how you deal with weeds since it's such a big concern? Sure. I mean, whether it's thistles or dandelions, um, one of our method, methods is to um, cut them back so that it takes more of their energy pulled from the roots so they don't spread as much. So it's also to cut it back before they go to flowering, seeding at least. And if there are seeding, then we bag them. So that's partly to get the seeds out of the system. And then the primary method is to um, like overseed with compost and mulch. And it's a fine mulch. It's not wood chips, but sawdust because it's we don't want it to be visible in the grass. So it's a sprinkling of the seeds, compost and fine sawdust throughout wherever we work because ultimately we want to minimize our disturbance. And so that's why we do it carefully and by hand with foot. And then applying the soil nutrients, the amendments to the soil, whether it's the compost teas and the little bit of biochar and the fungal soup, the mycelium, and then the homeodynamic ash remedy. I think it's worth a test. Um, and the dilemma is 99% of the seed production that you would treat on our right. property, we don't have control. Of. Right. Do they mow or anything? It's no. untouched because, and, and that's the dilemma. Yeah. Is you have fairway. It's 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 the the golf course picture. Right. You've right. got fairways. Right. You've got rough, and then you got the place where we all lose our golf balls, <laughs> and um and that's designed to stay in in an untouched state. Yeah. yeah. No. Thank you very much for all of your time. We kept Andy, one more question. Yeah, I just want to point out again, I am working on that plan for Glacier Club. So this is something that yeah. can possibly happen as well in conjunction. So that if you get that completed, Mandy, and make our work a lot easier. I so know. why don't you just get busy and get around the thing? We got a whole mastermind of yeah. all kinds of experts. Exactly. You know, and, yeah. and just, just with so many, and I, from one, if I, in my home, <laughs> I don't apply anything. Mm -hmm. Why? because it's under control and there's no seed production anymore and, and, and a healthy grass just takes care of it all. Right. Yeah, but I don't have grass. a I don't have glacier to compete with right. next door. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on it. Mike. Well, you know, axiomatically, you know I, I can barely hear you know, uh, We know it as well. I don't know the other areas that well. But what you're talking about with seed coming from areas between the golf course and east side of your unit. Right. That's your that's your biggest deficit of water versus seafood. Right. In the whole place. Right. So you have to get you don't have a healthy water. Well that's correct. Right? And so we're talking sea production being astronomical in this area that we don't do anything about. It. Right. And, 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 you know, and, and, and the, which is the, what the, you were just saying. And the root, the, the root cause, <laughs> no pun intended, the root cause is, um, the, you know, we mow it behind our places. Okay. Now it's not irrigated. And that's a whole nother topic that you and I happen to be in agreement on is it needs irrigation if we're to have healthy grass to, cry, to push out those weeds. But um, the root cause is that strip of grass. In between. I disagree. 
best trip of, of native stuff between the golf course and your back home. Very, Dan, I was just talking, very few species that come out of there end up infiltrating your lawn area very much at all, except perhaps dandelions, which dandelions can sort of self proliferate at the lawn. If that lawn is thick and thistle thing floats over, lands on top of that grass, the likelihood of that thistle seeding itself there is almost zero. So we have basic issues that are no brainers, you know, that we have we're not dealing with. And I think a lot of residents would be willing with hoses set out there or whatever to move them. They've got at eighty dollars an average for the track uh, sprinklers work wonders in a in a, a longitudinal area. I mean, there's a lot of things we can be doing that we're not doing. You know, and 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 without naming who's who, there are. That residents that do pull the hoses out. And, I agree. I agree. Maybe, maybe me and Clue. <laughs> and you are you you can treat the thistle as well, not just anything. Definitely. Be sure. Yeah. Oh, and I wanted to add the other speaker. Paul said it was the white fluff from the dandelions. It's mainly from the cottonwood right That's now. Cool. What we're getting yeah, along all the edges here. And I've been, if you up at High Point, you see me all spring pulling the heads of dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> so less seeds are going. Mm -hmm. yep. I have a question. Um, Andy Laudermilk in Austin. Um, th that was a very impressive uh, presentation. Have you considered being the size of Glacier to present this to them? which would make our decision a little easier because as long as you've got the elephant mm -hmm. uh, doing what they're doing, it's very difficult for us to do what you're saying without their participation. And, and, and again, I, I was very impressed with your presentation. I thought it was great. Uh, have you considered uh, talking to Glacier? Well, that's a great um, insight and I would be happy to offer a presentation or a presentation and or proposal to Glacier. And I this if, is part of the plan. If someone wanted to direct me to the right person or the right opening, I'd be happy to do that. Because you're right, that would be a fantastic win-win going in the right direction. Well, do, you, do you think we would be wasting our money unless they participated along with us? I don't think you would. I think it's gonna yeah. create healthy environments where you live, no matter what. Okay. All right. But I'm just concerned about the, you know, the, uh, they're talking about the wildlife. Uh, if we've got glaciers spraying the golf course and up to our doorsteps, what they're doing, um, it seems like we're all going to have to do this together. Or it just may not work. I like how you're thinking. I agree. That's, that's the well, best. I wish, you would, I wish you would tell my wife. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. I just want to answer this question. Andy, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that's that's part of the plan, and Katrina's on the mastermind. So we're putting together a plan to present to them so that they can look at it and absorb it in much the same way we're talking about here. Gary? Yeah, one thing I'll say um, in response to Mike, it's not stuff that we're just not doing when you talk about waters. Part of the problem is if, if you take a look at our sprinkler system, it's on at night. It's not on during the day. Part of it, but water, shady areas. I, I, yeah. I, I understand that. that. But nice. if you water during the day, so much of that just evaporates. So it's not very useful. Even Glacier, for the most part, doesn't water during the day. So when people go out, if you're one of the culprits here, Mark, <laughs> going out and watering, a lot of that water is just wasted. So it would be good to do it at night. But that requires an irrigation system. And to put an irrigation system in, we've discussed this last year, behind, say, Gamble Oak, and then to run water, you're talking about a lot of money. 
You I'm just took a waste the car. That's weird. Well, that, that no may one be. said it had to be there in the day. I wouldn't mind it with others in the heat. I just know that when somebody goes by with that car and it's like a dust storm, and the, the fact that you just clean the windows is a joke. You're not at all covered with dust. I'm just saying there are, there are no no brainer non um yeah, I mean, it's just not a financial issue that can be improved. Number one, regardless. Of what well, yes. I would just say that anything that has to do with water is not going to be a non-financial issue. It's, it's going to cost money. Well, Mark, isn't there a new system coming? That's we're going to get into. We're going to, you know, all of this stuff. None of this is is um, unknown. Mike, right. you and I talk about this continuously all summer long. And, and we're going to talk about what we're doing with the irrigation system once we get into the um, nuts and bolts of our 2023 work plan. But when somebody loses a ball in that rough area, that real rough area on the, on the firm behind those units, and they come walking up and they see this area that in the middle of August looks kind of like a desert. How is that held the golf course situation? For it's, you know, you have curb appeal out here front of the units to sell units. I get that. But the fact that when people get up on that burn and they look down at that, it's pretty embarrassing. I, it, I agree. I just want to make a financial point, uh, two financial points. One, I just want to make sure everybody's clear Katrina's option is less expensive um, than Scott's option. So that's one thing. And two, it, it is a proven fact, I can post these studies as well, that as soils heal, and this might take you know a year, two, three years, but as they heal, they hold more water. You can have a reduction in water bills by like 20 to 30%. That's massive, given that Tamron's biggest bill is water. So I don't know if Katrina has a comment about the water aspect, but it's really amazing. And that's what happens when we work with nature as opposed to against it. Mm -hmm. I would just say the studies that I've seen also um, attribute to that yep. as well. Yeah. Should we move on? Let's move on. Okay. R R Rich is kicking me here. Thank you for thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. 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 Take care. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we will move on. Um, the agenda, we've got several other things. We're going to talk about ornamental bed maintenance. We're going to talk about irrigation upgrades, which is seems to be topic de jour. And um, we're going to be talking about um, going through the work plan. And that is a little bit tedious, but I, I would encourage people to stick around because um, and we spent a lot of time last year on on this topic. On all, it, it's just almost um, amazing. You could say Paul and to some extent Katrina. And I, we haven't shared notes, but the notes are the same. So with that, um, let's talk about the ornamental bed maintenance. I had a um, question from Brooke. We, if you're in High Point, if you're in front of the lodge, and Gambolo come next week you will see that the ornamental beds are going to be completely rebuilt. Um, that is being done by um, a company named Blooming Designs, the, the person's name, Brooke Safford. And um, what I, and I don't know if you noticed coming to the lodge this morning, it really looks good compared to um, last year. It's planted with fresh plants. In another month when things, you know, do their growing, it's going to look really good, I think. And I think, I know in Gamble, all of, all of my friends in Gamble, we've been rousing for um, those beds to be rebuilt since almost the day that I, I, I moved in five years ago. So, um, and that'll be done. But that doesn't come without maintenance as the summer goes on. Now we're going to use a lot of mulch. We're going to use a lot of mulch to retard wheat growth. Um, Brook. Um, asked about um, what we're going to be doing for maintenance, and I told her to hold off. I know that we've lost. We had a fellow named Catfish, who, and, and we lost him. And Paige told me this morning that there's a new catfish. And, and Bobby, maybe you can explain that to the group just so we know that. Yeah, we got a couple of summer seasonal people that are in the beaches. 
Got a bed design going now. There's bread and molds today. Yeah. Here, so they'll move to different areas. Okay, so what I'm going to tell Brooke is um, all we're we've got it taken care of. Yes. Okay. Um, next, um, irrigation upgrades. So what I think I'll do is I'll I'll go to the plan just so everybody can know what we're, we're, we're doing for irrigation upgrades. First of all, on the east side of, um, of Gamble, where we have the Sierra Desert, um, I advocated for um, irrigation, a zone of irrigation to go along the entire east side last year. And, and as Gary said, the cost is not low. Um, and given our other budget constraints, and you know, our budget was tough last year, and that was just one of the things that we just couldn't do. Um, it's on the radar screen. That is a problem area. We get that morning sun and it's just, it, uh, as you said, Mike, when the lawnmower comes, the dust just goes up and it fills our units and it's just terrible. Well, it um, gets bombed so much by sun that it changes for two weeks. It, it, two well, weeks well, well, it great. Now it's dust. We had six feet of snow there um, a month and a half ago and now it's dry and dusty. Okay. So you, you know you have to deal with it. Yeah, but but we are doing irrigation upgrades elsewhere, and and the, the other thing I've committed is is we are going to do things that save water, um, the efficiency, and and Ryan will will turn it over to you here in a second. Just just working on the the system and getting it to work like it's supposed to, is is something that Ryan has worked hard on. I know last year at Gamble. Um, it took him days just to get the center island sprinkling zone to work. And I don't know if he ever did figure out what was wrong with it, but I saw it was working yesterday. Um, so just getting us to baseline is a work in progress. Some of the things that we are going to do this summer is, is um, along the units where we have zones that are just parked behind bushes, we're putting in risers because the water just sprays against the bushes and never finds its way out to the grass. That's waste of water. Um, we are going to um, change our irrigation schedule to every other day. That alone, common sense would tell you, would, would cut down the water use by half. Um, it also would drive roots down and allow the roots to go deeper and, and access the water to the, the deeper depth. It's too, too, too. Any, any turf specialist will tell you that you want to drive the roots down by, by watering every day and keeping the surface moist, the roots stay on the surface. And then when it dries out, there's no water there for the roots. So that's another uh, initiative that we'll be doing. Um, another initiative is, is um, this month, this June is the dry month and we will not see much rain probably this month, but then the monsoons move in. And sometimes during the monsoonal periods, we have really wet conditions for quite a, for, for a week on end. We're going to be putting in water sensors at Gamble and at Pinecone, where, where we have single main masters going out to the um, system to, um, to um, shut off the system and save water when, um, when, the, when the lawn doesn't need water. So those are the things that we're doing. Um, with that, I thought I'd, I'd ask Ryan where we stand with Bobby. Maybe Bobby's going to do more of the installation side of things, but um, you know where where we stand, and just give a report on, on on the irrigation system because as everybody's heard, this is one of the big deals. Well, I'd like to say um, last year was our first year here, and I went through the entire irrigation system. It probably took me a good six weeks just to go through it touch every sprinkler, just, just to give you an idea of the amount of sprinklers out there, there's about five boxes in each condo area. Each one of those boxes probably has um, 12 zones. Um, so that's roughly 350 sprinklers in each area, probably around a thousand sprinkler heads. The line, you spend five to 10 minutes on each one and changing it up in a considerable amount of time. Um, Last year was my first year learning about that. So we had our water running every day just because I wanted to try to learn as much as I could. This year we've cut that in half, like he's, uh, like Mark said, or we're doing every every other day watering. So we're hoping to save, you know, a lot of money, uh, water and, and money there. Um, 
That's really about all I got unless you have some questions about that. Now the risers, there, you know, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, so that's just something that'll be, that'll happen, you know, progressively across the summer. Right. Um, Bobby, I, and we just never got together on terms of, of the status of the um, of the um, sensor. Yeah, we can talk so about it today. We'll talk about it today, but, but we think by the time oh. June's it, we can get that installation done. Yeah. I don't think June is it matters because June is going to be much dry. difference right now. June is going to be dry all month long. But then the monsoon said so we'll see come back um in november and we'll compare 2022 water use against 2023 water use and see if we've done any good um i know the board's going to be looking at it hard because i've, I've made a soft commitment that we're going to save money on, on water this year and water we talk about scots we talk about the different landscaping elements water at tamron is what do we pay per thousand about 26 bucks it's a huge amount we pay for the water here. It's a big deal. It moves the needle in our annual budget. So anything that we can do to save water um, will move the needle in the right direction. And, and I'm pain in the neck about saving the water. And then, and then we'll talk about a little more, some of the other things in the longer term approach, replacing rocks, stonework in strategic places, maybe stonework and mulch like they've got at the entrance up there by um, to, to Glacier up by High Point. Go look at that. It looks really good and it doesn't use water and it doesn't have weeds. So we'll get there. Any questions from the from the group on irrigation? Okay, so now we'll plow through the um, work plan. And I think that I just, just to get the feel for where we are. Um, so the regular maintenance is ongoing. And and if if anyone has comments on how that is ongoing, please say it. Um, one of the things that Gamble and, and Trish and I have talked about this is we've got that cluster of trees in the front that doesn't have much aesthetic appeal that um, would like, you know, as the summer goes on, would like to either get it trimmed down to one I'd like info from um, Gary, Trish, um, Kim. You live right there. You know, do we pull it up and put an aspen tree there? Is one just one tree there good? What is it that you'd like to see to make it look a little bit better rather than having the cluster with weeds and, and thistle? Last year it had a nice thistle crop around it. Um, what, what do you want? And I, I would prefer not to have it removed. I think if we can trim it back so that we have like only two specific, yeah. you know, two specific plants as opposed to like trees or whatever they are supposed to be patch or whatever, that would be. I, I think the whatever is the problem. Yeah, it just needs to be cleaned up. I think. And and again, again, you talk about the curbside appeal. That's the first thing everybody sees when they drive into Gamble Oak. At least first thing I see is what's going on there. Yeah, so. and we do have the dry weeds right there as well. So. Um, you know, the, the truck, truck trimming, and, and I've got to compliment these guys last year. I, I know that we had people tripping over overgrown shrubbery two years ago, walking down their stairs. Um, I think they did a really good job getting it pulled into shape last year. We've actually bought some decent equipment that makes the job easier. And I think that, um, we'll, that, that, that will keep up and, and I, I'm pleased about that. Um, we we put us obviously I'm not going to go into weed treatment. The, the, a stick has been stuck in and spoke on weed treatment. We had planned on once it's got this spring, and then we were going to go later on in the year to just spot treatment of troubled areas with the objective of um, eliminating weed treatment. We've got a lot of exploration to do. I would recommend it. I know I'm going to go down and look at parks and and see what we're in for. Um, uh, I know what I don't know, and this is a topic I don't know a lot about. That's why we had the presentations today. So um, we, that's a work in progress. Um, we are going to be doing a lot of work with word chip mulch in front of Gamble. I don't know if, well, we're almost all from Gamble here, but in front of the laundry area, I don't know if you remember last year, there was two worlds. There was the world where um, they had put down a barrier, they ran out of barrier, if I remember, and there were no, and, and wood chips. 
and there were no weeds. And then there was the area where they ran out of barrier and we couldn't keep up with the weeds. So they're going to finish that this year, put down that, that barrier and, and lots of wood chips, which we've got an unlimited supply. Um, we know what works there under trees. I think there's other areas under trees that obviously we're never going to see grass. And that is the type of treatment that along with stone in the long term that I would envision. Um, and we are working on getting boulders. Boulders, um, we will be placing some boulders, except for Trish. She's not going to get any boulders. <laughs> We're going to be placing boulders in strategic places, places where owners have contacted me, where um, it's just not good. People are driving in front of their front walk and um, parking and forgetting they parked and all kinds of problems. Also, I don't know, Gamble last year, I don't know how many people remember the the our, what happened that one holiday where it was like a parking lot on our grassy area, boulders to discourage that. Um, the boulders are free. They are free. So that's a good thing. That means that that works really well with the budget. It's free stuff. Um, that's all I've got on on the um, scope of work BHP contracting. Folks have anything to add to that? Any any other comments that we've got? There's some out of scope things, and and I've already mentioned it. Um, there's the um, rain sensors that we'll have done by monsoon season. We're going to do it just at Gamble and and Pine Cone because it's easiest. They only have one master control in kind of complicated up at High Point because High Point was developed sort of as multiple communities. So they got kind of multiple water systems and it's just, let's see how it works first. Again, I'm an incrementalist. Yeah. Also, we have the issue at High Point that our soil is thinner yeah. at High Point than it is in Gamble Oak and Pine Cone. You got better, better soil in that area. So we're not gonna retain moisture very well up in High Point. And so money being spent on the sensors down there makes much more sense. Yeah, just one, one, let me just say one thing and then you're on maybe. So um, just one thing, and actually Pinecone is like this too, is, is Pinecone and Glacier, Pinecone and, um, and High Point were glacial scours, which means is, is the glacier actually scoured those areas. And prior to Tamron, there was no soil up there. That soil was hauled in. And so it's very thin. Um, the helicopter pad south is a glacial outwash. So the soils there are incredibly thick. So if you go look on, on the SES soils map, we've got a completely different soil series down at um, Gamble than you've got on the two areas that are essentially artificial soils placed on a, on a scour. Mandy? Um, yeah, even though you have differences in soil type, I do want to point out that it is possible to build soil organic matter anywhere. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Not, I mean, Katrina's got a lot of options, but there are more. So I just want to say that as something to not be super concerned about that because there are options. Mm -hmm. Talked about fabrics. We're going to be doing that. Um, we talked about the ornamental beds. We talked about um, wood chip and mulch from the tree pruning campaign, which is <laughs> unlimited supply. And, and you know what? As um, I guess Paul Brown said, a lot of these organics are nitrogen consumers as they break down. But those chips will have been sitting there now for almost since last fall. So they have started to rot and they will be very good um, for mulch and it's free. You know, that, 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 that's the good thing. Um, and that is all I have. Oh. That's all I have. Is there any, any other questions before? Um, and we actually have one other thing, owner's comments, but owner, owner's comments have been sort of free flowing today, but um, I'll just look around. So, so go, go ahead first. No, you, you all right. So uh, I, I was reading this. So you, in Gamble, if you're still gonna remove that fabric underneath there, because Brooke had said, you know, not to do it, just green. No, 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 we are going to remove, that's a good question. Yeah. So at Gamble, and I believe all of the areas, if you dig into the old ornamental beds, 
if you get about this far down, there's like a fiberglass mat. And um, it's impossible. It just, it's, Brooke said she can do it by hand, although we've got um, equipment available if she runs into a, um, a hard surface, let's just say. But it's going to be removed and it's going to be replanted with native species, low water native species. And then it'll be replaced with a generous um, layer of mulch to retard weed growth. Okay, because the one thing last year when we brought this up, I contacted a master gardener. She said not to remove that because it would increase weeds. So, you know, and I had written that up and I sent it to you guys. Well, if but, you go down and gamble and look, yeah, those beds, how would you describe them? A mass? But she, Brooke said she was going to take some things out and leave some of the plants there, not completely well, disturb them. Again, the, 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 when I, th I think we're talking the same thing. That, that, okay. that matting is about six inches deep. It's an old tech yep. fiberglass yep. mat. And um, in order to, to re <clears throat> remediate those beds, it's got to go. It's just got to go. There's no, no way you can get a shovel. And that's what they did in High Point last year. I know, and I am not happy. But um, what, but what, Brooke, Brooke had said she wouldn't, did not um, see that that fabric would be there because of the perennial plants. No, well, that's not my understanding. Well, the perennial plant, the, the, the beds have not been managed at Gamble for perhaps. No, I understand that. Decades. But and, there's and managing order. and there's managing. So that's not two that's different, not, that's two not. different things here. So, okay. Need to well, I think out. it's ironic that in one sense we're saying we want to go to natural methods, and in another sense we're saying we want to leave artificial mats in place. I think her point is at this point, removing it would be massive disturbance. Is that kind of that I was, think, that's I, what I, I think, Well, I think what the plan is, Brooks. Marching orders are to excavate the existing beds and replace it with all new water, low water, native species. That was not what I heard. Oh, Rich, I don't know. That's that's uh, what, we've I, been that's what I. That, that's you weren't me. here. You walked with me. Several <clears throat> of us walked with me. We walked down there. We discussed the beds at the time. I don't know if you were there, Ryan. Um, the April meeting when we walked down to the Gamble Oak and we talked, Brooke talked with us what plans to do down there. Before. I was there. Was at that I meeting. was at the meeting yeah. we moving the maps. Yeah. But I, she I, said not to do that. No. But we need to contact her, recontact her and get clarification. That's fine. Well, yeah. I think we contracted Brooke to do the, do the beds and yeah. It's kind of her judgment as to well, yeah, but how we go about what that. Mark is saying is different what I understood. She said not to bulldoze those things. No, she said she didn't know if we needed mechanical equipment. She thought we could get it all done by hand by not okay. causing a much disturbance because we got the Fraser furs there that she was concerned that mechanical equipment might damage the roots of the Fraser furs. That's my understanding. Let's just recheck. Thank you. But 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 what I've gotten from the um, general consensus, and I walk, we all have dogs, but I'm walking it, dogs. It does my eye. I can't take it. Am I on? Okay. Why don't we find out what Taryn was doing? We've been here off and on since 2012. One of the reasons we bought here were the beautiful flowers. And they didn't look anything but natural and beautiful. And I don't know why after her being here for over 30 years, all of a sudden things look, I don't wanna use um, a bad word, but they don't look good. And it looked good ever since we saw it in 2012 until the disinformation about her quitting has been floating around here. I have talked to her personally. I've talked to several other people and we all find it very difficult to believe she would ever quit the job she loves. I think we ought to bring Karen back and all your problems would be solved. 
Well, we'll contact Burke and just be sure. We'll what, be sure, but um, what was you know, if, if the the landscape committee met nine times last year, we've gone through these issues. Um, we were given advice by a number of um, of professionals that unless we go ahead and retrofit the beds. That, um, and, and there were some that even wanted to be more drastic than what we're doing now by actually removing the soil and replacing the soil. We didn't want to do that. That it was going to require a, a, a lot of work. You know, sometimes you have to start over because all plants have their life cycle and our beds at Gamble are way overgrown. And our objective is to have it look. And, and, and what we said for the visual and, and whether it be the the way we're going to deal with weeds and and, uh, and garden and, and lawns, whether it be to, what, at the end of the day, it's what does it look like? That's all we care about. The, yeah. Landscaping is an aesthetic, and we're a golf course community. The example that the committee has has explained to Brooke is we want it to look very similar to how it looks around the mine shaft. Simple, clean, native species, Abundant use of mulch and organics, um, something that's pleasing to the eye. However, we get there, that's how we're going to do it. So she took that all that man. Did you have a question, Mike? Yeah, I, I just wonder after this discussion, where are the, the garden areas that don't have irrigation? And using an example of this because, and Gary, I'm not specifically saying what you said is true. However, the area, big triangle by irrigating, by irrigating, the kidney, felt water a bunch with poses last year. My feeling is that is a perfect deal Is that what we're going to do? Are we going to water areas? What are we going to do? Because obviously the irrigation is not going to happen. Is there a plan? For areas that don't have irrigation, which is what I'm, what I'm wondering if you can get better. Yeah. But right now, I'm not hearing the plan at all for irrigation. Mike, the additional irrigation zones did not get budgeted for this year. That and, 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 and we, you know, I don't know who watered in front of um, 701. Um, I it think it'll residents. I think it'll probably it'll probably happen again this year. And that, and I get that. That's what I'm saying. It did get water during the day. I don't think the day versus night is that big an issue. What is an issue is areas that aren't in the in your immediate line of sight when you drive in gamble are not getting water. Mike, I know exactly what you're saying because we live on the same side. Well, I, I don't say, know. When Mother Nature isn't cooperating. I understand the water sensing, all that is great, but I know that we still water in shady areas on the west side that don't need water. And yeah. it runs, it's just running everywhere. Well, and it's soppy, it's a mess. Let's, you know, hopefully our, our every other day management practices and such, let's just watch and see how the summer goes on. You know, we've well, got a line. Right now, it's it's a dust bowl back there directly yeah, behind the first two units. That's, it is. And that's kind of we can throw a sprinkler out there. What's that? We can throw a sprinkler out there. That's all we're asking. I'll move the ditch. Put you back in and let's address this stuff instead of just the triangle area where you're driving in. Because people stand up on that burn, picking up a ball, and they look down and they go, What the hell is going on down here? It's a, it's ridiculous. So I'm just wondering if there's a plan. There's a vision of the documents if you want to do special session studies. Do that. They well, the irrigation system. Apparently, people got in trouble last year with water and climate. So, what I'm saying is, you can special assess yourselves like those buildings there. You can special assess and put in sprinkler system. You can pay for it yourself. It, by, I think what Rick is referring to is there's a provision in the bylaws that um, any I think almost not down to any unit, but um, you know, can can be, and of course there's a process that you'd have to go when you say special assess that you'd have to go through the board to have that process implemented. But there is a there is Mike, if if the East 
the Gamble East Siders, I'll call us the Gamble East Siders, wanted to put in a zone of sprinkler systems. I think that we could go to the board and request a special assessment of the East Siders to put a zone of sprinkler systems on the east side, and that could go through the process and be approved by the board. Is that what you're saying, Rick? Yeah. If we wanted well, to do that, we've never talked, talked about it. Is that what you attempted? No, what I attempted last year in, in, the, in a draft budget, I want to make it clear, the draft budget, because we had a lot of overriding factors in last year's budget, but um, is that it would have been come out of general revenues, which would have been paid for Tamron as a whole. Well, and there's a lot of things that are paid for Tamron as a whole that only impact specific areas, okay? But in this case, it was one of those things that yeah, the money just wasn't available. Well, in the interim, all I'm asking, I think I'm speaking on behalf of the Superintendent. The East Siders. Is that right now, everyone's ready. And we love the fact that you guys are great. We love the fact that but it's a whole and that to me, you know, if you start talking about the dues you're paying per month, it's not congruent with what it's not congruent with the golf community. Period. End of story. That's all I'm saying. End of story. Yeah, and, and Mike, thank you for bringing it up. It's not the first time it's been brought up. Thanks. Well, I mean, last year was the first time that we had in front of 701 and 704 over there. That was the first time we had water. And so we actually had a little bit of grass over there and not that dusty stuff. And we still do have that, but obviously the watering alleviated it all of the dust and made it look a lot better. But that was the first time that it happened. The Tarrant was swimming and maintaining the area. No one yeah, and I, I put that out last year and I was going to actually, Mike, I was going to do that this week. I was going to put that sprinkler out again this year because of, you know, we had some moisture at the beginning of the year. It was looking good, but now it's, you know, yeah. It needs water now. And it's partially because we don't really have a turf built up in over the years from that issue of nothing happening. You know, and, and it looks better this year than it did the year before, particularly because of the winter. But what we went to did, it thought, you know, it's fine for that turf to go Yeah, we can we can get that going this week. Right. We'll make a plan down there. Sounds great. I'll stop this evening. And, you know, speaking for myself, anytime I've, I've, Ryan has been just more than receptive to folks when they, when, when asked for things. I, I mean, it's, it's been a delight for me. And um, Ryan, unless you say no more, um, I think what I'm hearing is just go to Ryan and ask him and he'll be glad to help out. Don't keep him from working. <laughs> yeah. He's a busy guy. We can make it work. Bless you, Ron. So just want to make sure everybody knows Brooke Safford is doing our uh, beds up here. She will be speaking at the Regenerative Landscaping Speaker Series June 21st at James Ranch at 6 p.m. So you can access that with Zoom or you can come down and grab a burger and see her speak. Anybody else? Well, with that, I'll adjourn. Well, do I need to do any motion? We're very formal. <laughs> I make the motion that we adjourn this meeting. I second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody, for coming.